And good evening, everybody. Welcome to In the Cosmos Live from the De Anza College Planetarium. I'm your host, Toshi Komatsu, Director of the Planetarium. And uh, we'd like to wish everybody a happy Astronomy Day. Today's uh, National Astronomy Day. And so we thought we'd bring you a little program here. Again, we were hoping to show you some live views through a telescope. Unfortunately, the weather is not cooperating with us. So unfortunately, we won't be able to show you some live views. But if you joined our our star party last time you saw some of the views that we uh, had through an EV scope. So we'll be doing kind of a similar thing with a slightly different focus this time around. But before we get too far, we do want to make sure that we thank everybody for attending. Uh, and I want to introduce my co-panelists for the program here. And first off, we have my good friend and co-host, uh, Mike Askins. Mike, go ahead and say hello. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to... Uh... The virtual planetarium here tonight. Uh, we're sorry about the uh, the telescope not being able to be live tonight, but we have uh, quite a few galaxies to show you that we uh, imaged with the telescope a little bit earlier. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, can't wait till we can actually get back in the planetarium, but uh, for tonight, we'll have a good time here in the virtual planetarium instead. Back over to you, Toshi. Thanks very much, Mike. And uh, as before, we have also a special guest here uh, who's uh, Alan Gould from the Lawrence Hall of Science. And so, uh, Alan, why don't you go ahead and say hello to everyone? Well, hi from Berkeley, California. Uh, we're, we're socked in cloudy here, like uh, most of the Bay Area. So I'm just set, I set up in my living room for now instead of out in the park. <laughs> All right. Um, so before we get started or before we really get into things, we do want to uh, make a special thank you to the Foothill De Anza Foundation for sponsoring these programs that we do here live uh, streaming on YouTube. And uh, again, happy Astronomy Day. Before we get into the galaxy views, uh, hopefully uh, you might be viewing somewhere that is clear, unfortunately not clear here in the Bay Area, but we thought we would at least start off and take a look at the sort of view that you would see if it were clear. So we're gonna switch over to Solarium here and take a quick look at the sky and for some things that you might look for tonight here. So you should be seeing Stellarium here. We're looking towards the Western part of the sky and it's a little bit uh, small that I have the moon here, but uh, we've got uh, looking towards the West. This is the current time. It's uh, eight, uh, it's, uh, actually it's not the current time. Let me jump ahead and make sure that we are looking at the current time. There we go. We're looking at 9.03 PM uh, Pacific daylight time uh, here in, uh, Cupertino here. And near the center of the screen here, we're looking towards the west, but here you can see the crescent moon. And uh, if it were clear where you are, you might be seeing the crescent moon as well. Uh, and usually the way they choose astronomy day, it's a date in the springtime that's closest to the quarter moon, because that's a good time to be looking at the moon. Unfortunately, the quarter moon this year or this spring is on a Wednesday. So the decision makers, those who choose astronomy day, they decided to go for the Saturday before that. So that leaves us with a crescent moon. But if I zoom in a bit to the crescent moon here, tonight there's something special happening with the crescent moon. Again, unfortunately we aren't able to see it uh, in our real sky because it's, uh, it's quite cloudy, but uh, you can see a little red dot there right next to the moon. And I've made the moon here. It's a little bit bigger than it would appear in the normal sky. But uh, if you have a clear view, you might be able to see that. But maybe some of you can put in the chat and guess what this red thing next to the moon happens to be tonight. And I'll give everyone a hint that this is not a star, but it's actually something else. Even though it might look like a star, it's not a star. And so again, you can put in the chat if you have a good guess as to what that thing might be. Uh, I bet Mike has a guess. <laughs> Well, while we're waiting for, for the uh, people to chat what they think that object is, I will also put another clue out there, Toshi, that if you look at the, the star that's down further, what much further, look at the amount of twinkling that's going on there. Look on at the amount of twinkling that's going on with the red object. That may give you a clue. And it looks like some people putting in the chat that it is Mars. So it is a planet. And uh, tonight we have a close approach 
of the moon and Mars. So if it's clear where you are, then you can see the moon, a beautiful crescent moon next to Mars. If Mars isn't as bright as it was a couple months ago. It's starting to get a bit fainter in the sky at the moment. But uh, a couple of people uh, did recognize that this is Mars that we're looking at. So a nice close con uh, close approach of the of the two bodies there. And that happens every now and then. This is a particularly close approach. The Mars and the moon are only separated by about a degree and a half. They're actually a little bit further away. Their closest approach will be in a little bit here, actually 951 Pacific Daylight Time is when they will be at their closest, their very closest. Right now, we're a little bit before that. So they're a little bit further than one and a half degrees. That'd be pretty pretty nice to be able to uh, put those in the, binoc in the binoculars there, Toshi, because uh, I'm wondering if anybody can see the earth shine, the, uh, the little bit of glow of the normally dark side that you'd get there, reflecting light from the sun off the earth and back to the moon. Um, I love to be able to see that when I can. And with a pair of binoculars tonight, I'm wondering what that'll look like. Yeah, that's a great point that uh, this pairing of the moon and Mars, it's a little too close to catch in a telescope if you had a telescope, uh, because a telescope generally gives you a much narrower field of view. But in binoculars, this would be very pretty. And I bet you would be able to see some of that earth shine that you were talking about, Mike. Cool. Uh, and so you're, I think you mentioned, Toshi, and may, I'm sorry if I missed it, that the uh, this is sort of right in um, the con a sp specific constellation, that constellation of Gemini, right? Uh, yeah, it's uh, right in the middle of Gemini. I've backed away here a bit, and I can uh, highlight one of the stars of Gemini, and that's a star uh, called Castor that I've just highlighted. But I do that just so that I can pick it up in Stellarium. We can see sort of the dot-to-dot -dot version of the constellation here. And then I can turn on the artwork so we can see Gemini, the twins here, and you can see that uh, the moon and Mars are sort of right in between where the uh, right in between the two twins there. So again, pretty pairing in the sky, again, a wider field of view. You can see the two twin stars above them. Again, Mike was pointing out how stars twinkle. Mars does not twinkle because planets as a rule generally don't twinkle, at least not nearly as much as stars do. And that's because stars are pinpoints, even through a telescope, even through magnification. But planets, uh, they uh, appear as a disk. And so there's much less twinkling that we get. Not all that twinkling is due to our atmosphere. But uh, not too far away from uh, the twins and Gemini here looking at the moon. Uh, the point of uh, interest that we were looking for is a little bit more towards the south at the moment, a little bit higher up in the sky. I'm heading over towards a different part of the sky here where there's one bright star over here. And uh, Mike, why didn't you tell us a little bit about this star that I'm highlighting here? So um, that's that's the star Regulus, Toshi. It's um, a sort of a blue whitish star. And um, it's part of um, a very famous constellation, one of the oldest constellations, the zodiacal constellations are some of the oldest um, that we have. And uh, it's in the constellation of Leo the Lion. And I'll bet several of you knew that already. The part that I like to look at um, with uh, Leo there is the, um, I, I cue into the backwards question mark. And uh, I know Toshi, you sometimes see it as something a little bit different, but Toshi's pointing out right now, it's sort of like curved the other way. There's the question and the mark is down below there. That's Regulus. And Toshi, um, the rest of that constellation there, the other, the other stars that are back there are sort of the tail end of Leo. And I know um, that you've always thought that that looked a little bit more like a more um, oh, down to earth um, object up there in the sky. Can you remind me what that is? Yeah, if I take away the artwork here, sometimes and you ignore this particular line right here, I like to sometimes think of this as a bent coat hanger. So it's mm. sort of bent out of shape there. But uh, bent coat hanger is another way that people have uh, looked at. At least that's how I look at Leo here. Sometimes uh, my son, actually, when he looked at Leo and saw it for the first time, he saw it as a mouse. And if you imagine this part as being the head of the mouse, here's the body. And then the mouse has a little tail behind here. So several different ways we can see different constellations here. I I'm going I'm sorry, I was just going to say that I didn't, hadn't, didn't mention that that star Regulus, you'll notice the R-E-G that's in there, that's the root 
for king. And of course, it's sort of appropriate for the king of um, the king of the uh, jungle to have a star that has reg ulus. And I believe actually ulus means light. Is that, am I right about that, Toshi? I can't remember. Um, I don't recall right off the top of my head, but uh, light I'll, of the king or something. Yeah, like that. light of the king sounds again very appropriate for Leo here. Yeah. Um, We'll go ahead and leave uh, Leo up because our, our the part of the sky that we're interested in is not too far uh, from Leo. In fact, it's sort of between Leo and there's another constellation that's down here. This is a bright star here called Spica. And that's part of a different constellation called Virgo the Maiden here. And uh, that's part of a, the part of the sky that we wanted to focus on uh, tonight because as we take sort of a wide view here, right in between these two constellations, is a whole group of objects that if you have a telescope, like an EV scope, uh, is a fantastic place to be looking. And I've turned on in Stellarium here, um, a bunch of deep sky objects here. And notice that there's a big grouping of them right in between uh, sort of the tail of Leo and sort of the body. Let me put the, uh, the R work up for Virgo here, right? Sort of between, sort of around her head and around her shoulder there is where there's a whole bunch of galaxies. And I'm gonna zoom in on that, but as I do that, maybe Mike, you can tell us a little bit about that area. Yeah, Toshi, um, this is one of the best places to go hunting for galaxies um, in the sky. In the springtime, especially this whole area, which is sometimes referred to as the realm of the galaxies. And technically, there's a couple of superclusters of galaxies here, one called the Virgo supercluster, and the other one called the Coma supercluster. Coma coming from the constellation Coma Berenices. That's the constellation of Berenices' hair. Kind yeah, of let odd. me go ahead and put the artwork up here. You can see where is. Berenices <laughs> is. It's not as bright, doesn't have any bright stars like Leo or like in Virgo there, um, but it is the hair. Um, some people refer to it as a wig, but it was a hair. It was uh, the hair of a queen, actually, a queen of Egypt, as I recall, who sacrificed her hair uh, in exchange for the safe return of her husband, who had gone off to battle into uh, to war there. So she uh, made a, a sort of a token sacrifice of her hair uh, in exchange for, again, the safe return of her husband. Well, in the springtime, um, it's uh, especially uh, it's especially good to be able to view these galaxies, this cluster of galaxies that are right in the center. Um, for uh, a reason that I'm going to uh, point out uh, for you here, and I've got a little visual aid. I'm gonna pretend that our Milky Way galaxy, which is where the Earth is located. Here's my, uh, here's my galaxy. It's not quite, it, it looks a little thinner here than, it, than the galaxy itself would look if you could view it from the outside. We of course are always looking from the inside of the galaxy. You can see I put a little spot where the earth is, where I imagine that the earth is given that I know that it's about four fifths of the way out from the center of the galaxy. We're gonna be talking uh, a little bit more about types of galaxies in just a bit. Uh, the Milky Way is something that we refer to as a disk spiral galaxy. A disk type galaxy because it's got this sort of disk shape. Most of the stars are in the disk of the galaxy here. And if you are in the galaxy, like the Earth is, and you look out in the direction of this disk, you're going to find it fairly bright. You won't find a lot of galaxies looking in that direction because there's so much of the, our own galaxy that's there instead, which blocks the view. The other galaxies that we're looking for are out in different places around the Milky Way. So if you look in the direction of the disk, you're not gonna see very much. But if you look in a, in a perpendicular direction out of the plane of the galaxy here, you're gonna see more galaxies. And it turns out that that realm of the galaxies, the Virgo cluster and the Coma cluster are right in a very advantageous direction, perpendicular to the, to, um, to the, the disk plane of the galaxy there. And right in springtime is when it's pretty much overhead, that cluster, that super, set of super clusters there, the realm of the galaxies. So springtime is one of the most famous times for amateur astronomers who have got their backyard telescopes wanting to take a look at galaxies 
um, it's a perfect time to go looking for them. And that's why tonight we're focused a lot on Galaxy. We saw a couple uh, last month, but we're going to see even more of them this time and, and look at uh, uh, one particular one of those clusters, the Virgo supercluster. Anyway, that's sort of um, the idea of that uh, the realm of the galaxy stars. We just wanted you to know sort of where that is in the sky. Uh, it's right up near the tail of Leo there. Oh, back over to you, Katoshi. All right, thanks, Mike, for that explanation on the realm of the galaxies. And as we're looking around again, as Mike said, it's springtime is a great time to look for, uh, for galaxies because we're looking out of the plane of our galaxy. There isn't really an, ana an, an analogous spot uh, looking south out of our galaxy. So sort of springtime is really the best time to be looking if you have a telescope, as Mike mentioned. And speaking of telescopes, uh, again, we can't show you the live views through the telescope, but I know Alan has his telescope at least set up so that we can take a look and see what that looks like. So uh, Alan, I'm going to turn it over to you so that you can show us what the EV scope looks like, even if we don't get to see it actually in action here. So Alan. Okay, well, um... Let me uh, move to a place. And in fact, there's a little button on my phone here. Maybe I can switch the view. Uh, um, I'll back away from it a little bit. That's the telescope mounted on a tripod, um, which I take up to the park. It's not too far from my house. And uh, that park is where we took some of the pictures, some of the images that you're gonna see tonight. And uh, it, it's, it's operated with the iPhone, which I'm holding in my hand. Um, but there's, I made it a little mounting on, on that goes on the tripod. That's where the, that's where the iPhone gets mounted. And that's where I'm watching this event from actually from right there. But, uh, that's it. It's only about, it's only about, uh, five inches in diameter here. Um, it's a relatively small scope, but it gets very good images. And, uh, thanks for uh, explaining that, uh, Alan and, um, uh... Just want to make sure that it's clear to everybody that um, even though we're not going to be able to view through the telescope tonight, when we found out that the weather was getting bad, um, we went out uh, a few days ago and took some images. So we'll be showing you those images and allow you to pick out some galaxies in those images. Uh, I don't want people scratching their heads going, but it was inside his house. How could he be seeing with it? <laughs> so, um, so anyway, I just wanted to point that out. Toshi? Well, thanks, Mike. So uh, let's go ahead and get right to those images. Uh, originally, we wanted to show you a kind of a, a variety of things. Again, we showed you some images from last time to give you an idea of how the EV scope is really sort of a revolution in telescopes because it sort of builds up the image. The longer you leave the telescope on the object, the better and better the views get. So we won't have images this time that show the progression, but we'll have sort of a final product of good views or what we thought were some pretty good views of these different objects here. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch over to the first of our slides. And uh, I think Mike, you're gonna go ahead and talk us through those. Yeah, Toshi, um, we're, we're starting with something that is in the Milky Way galaxy, not an external galaxy, but just a, we're gonna look at a couple of things that are more close by. And um, the one that you're seeing here as very clearly labeled there is the, called the Owl Nebula. And I wonder if you can, uh, if anyone happens to know, if they know about this particular object, um, why, why it is called the Owl Nebula. Um, and I can sort of see it as I look at it, and maybe some of you um, are looking at it and it reminds you of something, you go ahead and uh, chat it. Um, I know there looks to me like there's a couple of eyes there, sort of darker. And what strikes me about this image, Toshi, when, it, when we were watching it uh, come in a few days ago, um, was the color. And um, I, it's, a, it's a very bluish color. This is something called a planetary nebula. And that's a very confusing name because a planetary nebula makes you think it has something to do with a planet. Well, it turns out that um, Many years ago, before people knew the nature of things uh, up in the sky, they would uh, take their, um, their, the um, telescopes that they were able to build at the time, probably like in the 17th and 18th or 18th and 19th centuries, and 
they knew that it was sort of planetary in the sense that it kind of was a, had a round shape as planets sometimes do. So they called them planetary nebula. What we know that a planetary nebula is not anything that has to do with planets, but it is the result of the puffing up of the star that's at the center. And you may be able to actually see one of those stars. And I think Toshi's pointing right at it there. It's right yeah, there. There's that, the uh, that central dot in the, in the center of all that fuzz there once was a star probably very similar to our sun. Uh, so we're getting kind of a sneak preview of what might our, our sun might look like in a few billion years at the end of its life. The sun will puff out its outer layers of gas. And that's what we see here. That's what the nebula is here. Nebula is just a fancy word for a cloud of gas in space. Planetary nebula is one that, uh, again, to uh, the earliest early telescopic astronomers looking at it, they didn't get very much detail. So they saw things that kind of look like disks. So they thought maybe they were planets. Today we know that they're not. The whole diameter across here is something probably on the order of a light year. So there aren't any planets that are a light year, one light year across. Uh, so this is quite large here, but the central star puffed out its outer layers. Um, and as Mike, uh, Mike said as well, he, how struck he was by the color that you can see here. I wonder if Alan, if you wanted to say anything about the, the sort of color that we saw or anything else that you remember about this particular image. Well, I, 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 when I was observing uh, in my younger day with, with the telescopes in, uh, that I, you know, a couple of telescopes that I built myself, I could never see color in the images. So mm. I was pretty much astounded when, uh, when I pulled out the, you know, started getting images from the EV scope uh, and having an enhanced image collection system that actually was bringing out color. And uh, I, I found it kind of amazing because most telescopes, you just can't see the color in those objects. And it, I'm reading, I'm reminded that uh, this was about an 11 minute exposure, hey, Alan? Uh, yeah, I think it's written on the, it's too small for me to read, but it's written okay. on the image. Yeah, I can yeah. see that, 11 minutes. Um, the other thing I wanna do is make sure that people are getting a sense of the distances of the objects. We're going to be moving out farther and farther from the earth here as we look, as we continue to look at objects. And, um, this particular object is about 2.6 kilolight years. In other words, about 2,600 light years. Now, um, just to remind you, if you've uh, forgotten or didn't know about light years before, the light year is not a measure of time. This kind of sounds like that because it says year, but it's a measure of distance. And it is the distance that light travels in one year. So basically we're saying that 2,600 of those in a line is how far away this object is from Earth. And the other factoid that I've got here that I'll mention um, is that the estimated age of this nebula, what, what I mean by that is the, the little star that puffed, ran out of fuel and puffed out its outer layers, um, did that, did so about 8,000 years ago is the estimate. So it's been looking like that for, for quite a while. Rather recent in astronomical terms, Itoshi. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, you find out very quickly as you study astronomy that uh, things get very old very quickly. Most things are quite ancient uh, in the sky. So even 8,000 years is something that's relatively recent when you talk in astronomical terms here. So, so this is under 3,000 light years. Let's go ahead and move um, to the next object that we were able to image with uh, the telescope. Well, before that, just a, just a quick uh, view here of uh, sort of this is a, a more detailed view through um, someone else's telescope. And again, you can see some color here. I would uh, like to note, though, that those images that we're going to be seeing through the EV scope through Allen's haven't been photoshopped. They haven't been adjusted. It came straight out of the telescope uh, as is. Uh, this one probably uh, has gone through some enhancement to the person probably spent several several hours uh, putting stacking images and, and getting a you know sort of a nice detail and a nice close-up view and that's something that you can do with your own uh, astro photo uh, astrophotography rig is you can uh, zoom in on the object and you can take a lot of images and stack them together but that takes a lot of time uh, and uh, takes a lot of patience 
but with the EV scope, uh, it just sort of appears this way. But again, just sort of a nice detailed view. This one, because it's closer up, you can sort of see the two uh, eyes that people have seen to note this as an owl in sort of a darker area down here that might be like a beak for the owls. So that's why it's called the Owl Nebula. Um, well, this started as a single star, but the next object that we're going to look at is a whole bunch of stars, in fact, about 500,000 of them, all in a cluster. The type, of, the type of object is a globular star cluster, and um, stars themselves image very nicely in a, a, a telescope uh, such as this, just because they have a high surface brightness. And you can sort of see, and what is this? This is about a three minute image, so we, let the telescope absorb light and accumulate it for about three minutes. I said there it was about, um, I said about 500,000 stars. And this one, the, the age of this one is interesting as well. Let me back up and just say, let me tell you the distance, because I told you the, la the distance of the last object that was about less than 3,000 light years. This particular one is estimated to be about 33.9 thousand light years or about 33,900 light years. So about 10 times as far away. These globular clusters are far, fairly far away compared to other things that we find in the disk. This is actually found in something called the halo, right Toshi? Yeah, so if you remember that that uh, the CD or DVD that Alan or that uh, Mike was holding up, there's sort of the plane of the galaxy where the, the disk is, and then sort of surrounding the center of the galaxy, um, which and on a CD or a DVD, there isn't a bulge. Our galaxy has a bulge at the center, but uh, with a uh, surrounding that bulge at the center is usually a halo of objects like these globular clusters. And these tend to be older objects, uh, some almost as old as the entire universe. So they tend to be very old objects here, but some of the detail that I can see in this image is that again, there's a lot of them concentrated in the, in the center. There's a few less as sort of you go outwards in a globe or in a sphere. And they're all globular clusters are sort of their, uh, their characteristic is that they are shaped like a globe where the stars are distributed like in a globe. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Alan just to see if he has Anything to, to add to the discussion here? Well, uh, I was trying to count the stars in that globular cluster, but I didn't. I yeah, got. Really. I didn't quite uh, get up to five hundred thousand. So, uh, the, the the technique of estimating number of stars is kind of interesting. You have to take yeah. samples of different places in it to try to figure out well how many stars are in there. <laughs> And uh, so again, this is a three minute view, again, unaltered straight out of the EV scope, but we can compare that with sort of a, a very high detailed uh, image uh, that, uh, that we found uh, through, uh, through the Hubble Heritage site. And uh, so you can see again that their stars are mostly concentrated in the center, but then there's sort of a nice distribution of the stars as you extend outwards from the center of this cluster here. Uh, this is of course, as, as opposed to uh, uh, open clusters, which uh, there's an example of an open cluster uh, right behind uh, Mike right now. He's in front, his background is an example of a very, very famous open cluster of stars, but you can see that there's a few stars in the case of an open cluster, there might be a few hundred stars in this cluster and they're, uh, they don't have that same globular shape. They don't have the same density of stars like you get with a globular cluster uh, which I'll go back to here. So, and they're not as far away either, Toshi. Right? Yes, the open clusters are much closer, and they tend to um, form in the disk of the galaxy, where again these globulars they form in the halo surrounding the uh, surrounding the galaxy. And and the other thing that uh, I always like to remember about globular star clusters is they tend to be some of the oldest stars that are to be found. Uh, and in fact, this particular one is estimated to have an age of about 11.4 billion years, stretching back to very early periods in, um, in, in the uh, galaxy's history. Yeah, 11 billion years, that's quite a fraction of the, the age of the universe, which today we're stating as 13.8 uh, billion years. So we're talking about 11 billion 
versus the entire the age of the entire universe. Again, that's about 14 billion. That's you know quite quite old. Again, we're talking about astronomical objects. There are a lot of them very very old, uh, especially in terms of the age of the entire universe here. So anyway, uh, let's go ahead and uh, progress further out here. We had taken these two objects that were in the galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, in our own galaxy. What we'd like to do is talk a little bit about galaxy types here so that you might be able to get an idea of the three different types to be able to spot in some of the images that we'll show you, um, to be able to spot some of these types. Now, some of them are very, very faint and difficult to type, but some to are brighter and more easy. Let's see, if there was a question here. How can the galaxy, how can the globular cluster be older than the Milky Way? We don't think that it is. And what you have to start thinking about, if those formed at the same time as the galaxy, that means that the galaxy is older, um, is you know, something on the order of the same, same age, um, Toshi, do you have any insight into that? I'd have to look up exactly um, the answer to Paul's question there. Um, no, I, I don't have any particular insight. Actually, I would turn it over to Alan to see if he would have any insight on Thank that. You, Alan. Well, the, the ages that you were mentioning, uh, the age of our galaxy is was less than, he said, it, you, well, the estimates now are like 13.8 billion years for the age of the universe. universe. Yeah. But the age of our galaxy is uh, is less than that. So ga galaxies have been forming since near the beginning of the universe. Uh, but I think they they tend to form and then they evolve over time, and they be, they change their shapes. Uh, some of the shapes that you're going to talk about, Toshi, I mean uh, Mike, uh, are things that galaxies evolve from and into. I don't think that answered the question, but <laughs> those are my insights. <laughs> yes, great question in terms of um, very interesting uh, effort to try and gauge the, the age of things that happened that far back in the history of the galaxy or of the universe. Um, let's go ahead and uh, look at that slide again, Toshi, the, uh, the galaxy types there. There are three basic types of uh, galaxy shapes. They're categorized by shape. Spiral, elliptical, and irregular. There's also one called, um, one that we won't talk about too much. We don't have any examples of it, I don't think, in uh, any of the ones that we're pointing out here tonight. But something called a lenticular type galaxy is a cross between spiral and elliptical. But let's learn about spiral, elliptical, and irregular and go from there. And you can see I put some of the uh, the characteristics, the words that describe um, the, the basic shapes um, in the, the bullets there. So a flat disk, we talked about how the Milky Way is an example of a spiral galaxy. Whirlpool shape, that's sort of the classic uh, view there that we uh, like to see in galaxies. Many, many, in fact, something like 60% of galaxies as a whole um, have this spiral look and whirlpool type shape. Stars are found in the arms, that's where they are, they are made, and usually have a central bulge. So if you were to look at it from the side, and we don't have any examples here of looking from the side, but um, you would be able, if you found an example that is like that, you would find a sort of bulges in the middle. Sometimes the bulge is also called the nucleus, the nucleus. That's spiral galaxies. Elliptical are a little bit smoother. They have a little less detail. There is no disk. They're sort of roundish or oval. And the stars are distributed fairly uniformly. And um, Toshi's pointing out uh, an example of an elliptical galaxy. Many, many of them in the Virgo supercluster tend, to, the ones that we uh, call attention to, uh, tend to be ones that are elliptical in nature. But again, they can have a very bright center and then very gradually drop off in terms of brightness. They can either be ellipsoidal or, or circular, uh, depending on the object that you're looking at. 
And Mike, I wanted to jump in that sometimes it, it can be a little tricky to tell uh, if you have a spiral galaxy, but you're looking at it sort of at a, at a funny enough angle, sometimes those arms aren't quite as apparent. And so sometimes they can look a little bit like an elliptical, uh, but do you want to kind of be looking for that bulge and maybe see if there's uh, some, uh, try to compare if it's, it looks like it's sort of more uniform, you can make out anything that looks like arms or, uh, or if, if there are arms or if there aren't arms there. So spirals, when you see an elliptical, again, it's it's sort of football shaped, uh, again, pretty uniform in the distribution as the, as of the stars, as you go sort of outwards, they decrease. Um, but uh, the tricky thing about spirals is sometimes you see them face on, like you see in this example here, sometimes are a little bit of an angle. Sometimes we see them edge on, and those can uh, look a little tricky uh, as well. So, but uh, the main way we classify galaxies, again, by shape. And if you don't have something that's spiral and you don't have even sort of an edge on spiral that maybe is trying to trick you and you don't have an elliptical, that leaves that last category. Mike, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Well, that's the one that's uh, one of those great names that astronomers give things that it's kind of obvious, irregular. In other words, it doesn't have the symmetry or um, the aesthetic um, sort of, um, what do I want to say, the aesthetic, um, the aesthetics that some of these, some of the, um, these ones like the elliptical galaxies or the spirals have, they're just different shapes. And, and I put in there that they're often shaped by close encounters. Galaxies many times um, get very close together and even pass through each other in a way that some people might call colliding something that's going to happen in our own galaxy in several billion years when the Andromeda galaxy, which is speeding toward us, we're speeding together with the, uh, the Milky Way and the Andromeda galaxy, they may interact. And who knows, if you wait long enough, we may end up with an irregular looking thing that's left after Andromeda and Milky Way end up colliding several billion years in the future. Yeah, I heard some astronomers that are thinking about this collision that's about to happen between the Milky Way and the Andromeda. They've thought about, well, what do we call this, this merged galaxy? And some people think that we should call it the, uh, the Milkdromeda galaxy is, is what I've heard, or they've come up with some other names there. Well, the, the good news about that, Toshi, is there's plenty of time where we have to think about, is that really the best name that we could come up with? Yes, we've got several hundred million years, as I recall. So. Yes. All right, let's see. So um, we've got spiral, elliptical, and irregular. And uh, those are the ones that, if you could just remember, you're going to look for spiral arms first. If you can't find that, can you find if it's a sort of symmetrical looking uh, like the, uh, the elliptical looks? And then finally, if it's not one of those two, does it look kind of odd and look like possibly there's something really strange going on? Those are usually the irregulars. So Toshi, maybe we can go ahead and look at, take a look at one of the galaxies that we imaged a few days ago and see if, um, if people watching the program can type this particular galaxy. So here's the first example. This is, uh, again, it's an EV scope image. Uh, I just made it a bit bigger so that we can see it, but here's the galaxy in question here. And again, we'll give people a, a moment or two to put their answer in their chat or their guess in the chat, which of the three types, uh, spiral, elliptical, or irregular, are we looking at here with this galaxy here? You can go ahead, when you think you know what the type is, you can go ahead and chat it. Um, okay. I know I have my guess. Well, again, the, the rules, the process is sort of to start looking for those spiral arms. If you can't see spiral arms, look to see whether or not you think it might be more of an elliptical, smoother. If not an elliptical, does it look really weird? And that's sort of the irregular version. And um, it's interesting, as we, we, we said, you notice that there is that very bright circle that's in the middle there. If this is a, if this is an elliptical, I think it looks pretty, um, pretty circular. What do you say, Toshi? Yeah, definitely one of the more uh, circular ones. Um, and I wonder if people can also remember back to the globular cluster, which was again sort of circular in the shape of a globe, 
Um, but if you look at the stars here, and with a globular, we were able to, even in the EV scope, make out individual stars. Yeah. Here with this, and we'll just uh, go ahead and say that this is an elliptical galaxy, that it's much more difficult to make out the individual stars that are part of the galaxy, it just kind of has sort of a, uh, sort of a, a fuzzy halo around it. And we'll see in the next image as well, that even through a very, very powerful telescope, uh, like the Hubble telescope here, uh, we're looking again at an elliptical galaxy. And even with the Hubble, we don't see the, in, it's hard, very difficult to make out the individual stars here. Uh, and that's sort of uh, a similarity between, or, or maybe a difference between globulars and elliptical galaxies. Um, they are sort of have the same basic sort of global shape, but there's, uh, there's, it's harder to make out the individual galaxy or the image of individual stars that make up this galaxy here. And we do want to keep track, keep track sort of of the, uh, the scale here, Toshi. This is a much, much bigger object, even though it's got sort of a general shape that's similar to the globular cluster. This is something, like you say, you can't see the individual stars. That's because of the extreme distance of this object. This is between 52,000 and 55,000 kilolight years, or Another way to say it is between 52 and 55 million stars. Um, and uh, something else to note about this particular galaxy that we're looking at, M87 there, um, there is a, is a jet that's emanating from the center of the galaxy there. And that's the result of something that made the news a couple of years ago now, uh, where uh, uh, scientists were able to image the black hole that's at the center of this galaxy. And this is a sort of a more recent image that's, uh, that's been updated. This came out a couple of months ago in March, uh, the uh, silhouette of the black hole uh, here shown with the, um, the magnetic field lines uh, that you can make out in this image here. I don't know if you want to say anything more about that, Mike. No, I thought it would just be interesting to put up there just because uh, people hear about it and they go, wow, there's a picture of a black hole. This was taken in radio with a radio, looking at radio frequency light. So it's a little bit different. It's sort of a shadow of a black hole. Yeah, the black hole is somewhere in the center over here. And then we have uh, sort of the radio light. Uh, that's showing uh, what's happening on, on the edge here. So it's uh, there's some a lot of complicated physics that goes into taking uh, images like this here. Well, let's go ahead and uh, try another one, Toshi, and see whether or not uh, people think they can look at this particular one that we took. Um, I can't actually, I'm going to see if I can see what the exposure was on this one. Yeah, this one, again, I zoomed in for purposes of the slide. I zoomed in a bit uh, on the uh, on the image, but again, otherwise unprocessed. And this is what we would have seen through the EV scope uh, had yeah. Alan been able to, uh, had it been clear for Alan. Um, and it was uh, four minutes, Toshi, I just snuck a peek. Four minute exposure for this exposure. one. So again, if you have a guess, uh, folks, if you wanna put it in the chat as to what type of galaxy we're looking at uh, in this case here. You might so find this one a little bit easier um, than I'm just guessing, we'll see if we can uh, get some chats about what type of galaxy this one is. The last one was called M87, Toshi. We forgot to mention that, I think, or at least I did. Yes, M87. I don't think it gets a better name than that. That's part of the, the Messier catalog, uh, right. 87th member of that catalog. And this particular one is um, in the same catalog is number 81. M81. And guesses are saying spiral. That sounds, uh, what do you think, Toshi? Is that right? Uh, I would have to agree, Alan, also giving a thumbs up in, in, in uh, my view here. And so uh, hopefully people were able to make out the spiral arms here. Again, unprocessed, uh, except for some internal processing that uh, I believe that we did. Maybe Alan can speak to that, some of the brightness and contrast that we, that we did on this image. What do we do then, Alan? Well, yeah, that's, um, there's certain things you can do with the telescope uh, using the iPhone control uh, or the smartphone control. You can, you can zoom into it with the control, but you can also switch over to uh, 
make adjustments on the enhanced viewing. You know, as the light is collecting, you can also change the brightness value of, of the star, the, well, the whole image, and you can change the background darkness, how dark the background is. And so by adjusting those two together, um, we, uh, Mike and Toshi and I had fun playing with that. They were telling me what to do with those adjustments. And uh, we, we came up with this, which I think is a pretty decent image of, well, of that galaxy. Alan, yeah, your and, explanation. And, I'm sorry, Toshi. Oh yeah, I was just gonna say, so we kept the brightness of the background up. That's why it's the image here looks kind of noisy in the background or what astronomers we would call this a sort of a noisy image in the background, but it did allow us to see the spiral arms that I think people were able to pick out here. And I think it's really important for people to understand that contrast and brightness are is a lot of what astronomers do to try and find detail. It helps you show detail that might not be obvious otherwise. It even gets more interesting when you start putting together images uh, of the same object taken in under different, uh, of different light frequencies and putting those together. Um, you're able to a lot of times see details that you won't be able, uh, that you're not able to see otherwise. And maybe Toshi, you can, sh you can show, uh, uh, the visitors, um, what this looks like in, uh, in, in the Hubble scope. Yeah, so again, this would be an image that was taken uh, with a much longer exposure um, and controlling for things, again, like the background. But again, you can see those long spiral arms, and I was noticing in the chat as well, uh, people, a couple of people mentioned that it's a barred spiral. That's sort of a, a more specific categorization of this spiral is that it does have a bar in the center here. That's why it's sort of extra elongated in the center here. But again, you can see these beautiful spiral arms in that characteristic sort of whirlpool structure that you get with uh, your classical uh, spiral galaxy here. And again, this would be similar to what our Milky Way is like, again, we live in a sparred spiral here. And if this were the Milky Way, we'd live about, we live about two thirds of the way out from the center of that galaxy here. And Toshi, um, I would also add that um, in those arms are where the bulk of the star formation is going on. Yeah, and this particular image, they're kind of highlighted with this sort of teal color, this sort of blue green mm -hmm. color here, extra areas of uh, star formation that are happening in this uh, in these spiral arms there. And this particular galaxy, a little bit closer to Earth than uh, the last one was. This is about between 11 and 12 million light years away. And you can tell that it's closer. I mean, I get the feeling that it's closer because it's a lot bigger um, than the, the other image that we were, we were looking at. And again, this one also at a little bit of a tilt in the Hubble image here. You can tell that again, we're not looking face on to this uh, this galaxy here, but we're at a little bit of a tilt. Uh, and so that's something again to look for with, uh, with spiral galaxies. But let's go well, ahead and go on to the next one here. Again, zoomed in to simulate this sort of zoom in that we would have been able to do with an EV scope here. But again, uh, people can perhaps put in the chat their guesses as to this galaxy type here? I think it's very likely that people will find this a little easier to, uh, if they had trouble with the other ones, this one might be easy. Um, and again, let me see if I can catch the, uh, the distance here, because I'd like to keep track of that for us. Um, about 12 million light years from Earth. So very similar to the, dis in fact, this galaxy is M82. The last one we looked at was M81. Though they are very close together in the sky, um, even though they may be many, many light years apart um, physically, um, but were named sort of sequentially in Messier's list, M81 and M82. And um, wondering what people are thinking about this one. We only had one left. If you use the uh, process of elimination, you could, uh, if you remember what that last one was, this was the one that is sometimes shaped by the history of what happened to the galaxy and guesses are saying irregular, great. Yeah. And uh, one clue that I like to look for, because again, if, if uh, well, the thing that I look for is this sort of dark lane that you can see in this galaxy. 
if that dark lane weren't there, I might guess, I might guess spiral because it looks like some of this outer part there, maybe that's an indication of spiral arms there. Uh, I might have been convinced to elliptical uh, because it has sort of that elliptical shape. But again, is it a spiral? That's on its side. But again, having sort of this dark lane, these sort of these asymmetries are kind of what would give it away uh, that this is going to be an irregular in this case. Well, thank you, Toshi. Um, Carolyn Brown is pointing out that I should define what Messier's list is. So it's spelled M-E-S-S-I-E-R, Charles Messier, French astronomer um, from the 1800s, was a comet searcher. And he made a list, I'm sorry, I can't remember if it's 17th or 18th century, so 18th or 19th century, sorry. Uh, but Messier was a comet hunter and he wanted to help other comet hunters. He wanted to give them a list of fuzzy objects, which is what comets look like before you have figured out whether or not they're moving or not. That's the basic way that you tell, is it a comet? Is it moving? Uh -huh among the stars over time, he wanted to come up with a list of the things that weren't comets so that people could avoid them. And so that's what the M stands for, Messier. Well, let's see, Toshi, uh, maybe we can go on yeah. here. Oh, maybe we've got an image of the uh, Hubble image of that uh, rather spectacular M82. Yeah, so this is the Hubble image. Again, you can see a lot more detail. Uh, they're a more powerful telescope than the uh, four and a half inch mirror that's on the uh, on the EV scope. Uh, Hubble, as I recall, has a 2.2 meter uh, diameter mirror, so it's quite a bit larger and collect a lot more lights. Um, but uh, you can see again a lot of these asymmetries, and and it sort of just doesn't fit in the other categories of spiral and elliptical. Uh, in in this view that you can see, there's a lot of uh, action going on here, probably caused by some interaction. Uh, I think we're thinking, and again, there's sort of this bright here, but it's sort of less bright here. You don't get that same symmetry on the other side here. There's just a lot of weirdness about this galaxy. And the view is that this is the result of the interaction of another galaxy that, that we're not aware of at the moment. Either they merged or something happened that caused it to, um, to look, like, uh, look like it does. This is a, one of those cases where astronomers assembled um, images taken in different types of light, both in visible and in uh, infrared light. And that's what we're seeing, that red stuff. Uh, that's what color they used for the infrared data. But again, we see uh, dark areas, lighter areas, and again, just sort of very, very chaotic. And again, that's what we would expect from a, from a merger here. Okay, um, shall we ready to go on to the next one, Toshi? Yeah, let's go ahead and take a look at, at sort of our next uh, object here. Um, this one not zoomed in anymore, and this is probably easy for folks to tell what sort of galaxy this is that we're looking at here, again, centrally located here. Uh, so I'll bet we, we might to... get quite a few people to be able to tell what's going on in this particular one, Toshi. Um, so, uh, so I think probably a lot of people will be able to guess that, uh, as I can highlight here, there are some spiral arms here. So we're looking at a, at a uh, spiral galaxy face on, but there's some other stuff happening here in this particular image, isn't there, Mike? Right. I'd like to see if people can spot any other galaxies that are in this group. Again, we've been talking about galaxy groups, the Virgo and the Coma cluster. This is right in the middle of the Virgo cluster. And so see if you can spot other galaxy action going on. Yeah, I'll keep my pointer off the image uh, for the moment here. But again, there's the central galaxy. But can you notice any other fuzzy things in this image that could be galaxies? So basically, if it's not a pinpoint uh, thing there, then it may be a galaxy. So we've got one galaxy to type, which is the one that's in the center. If you find other ones that are uh, not the one in the center, you might also take a guess. It's gonna be more difficult for some of these ones that are very faint to see enough detail to be able to actually type them. And maybe what we ought to do is just count how many uh, 
of the little galaxies that you can see. And maybe you can chat that if you're able to, to count uh, a few. How many can you see, Toshi? Uh, well, I can make out two pretty easily. I can convince myself maybe that there's a third one. Okay. How about, uh, how about Alan? How yeah, I think the, I think that's, that's true for me too. I, the, you know, I can, I can imagine <laughs> some, some others, but uh, two or three <laughs> for sure. Um, and maybe Toshi, um, we can go ahead and um, people are saying three Toshi. So I think there's some agreement there. Uh, there we go. And I went and looked at a star map and I tried to, uh, I went and figured out what the uh, catalog numbers were of there. I just told you about the Messier catalog, but there are lots of different catalogs of objects. There seem to be two more to the left and one in the lower right. Yes, that sounds like the ones that we pointed out there. Good for you, congratulations. Uh, two more, maybe the ones that are up to the upper left there. Um, okay, great. So you're getting to be good galaxy sleuths there. Um, there might no, be. No, Mike, Mike, what blows my mind when I'm looking at galaxies, I don't know if, you, if you've mentioned this before, but when we're looking at galaxies, these are many millions of light years away. Um, and that means that the, that, that, that we're looking into the past, basically, into the past of the universe. The farther away we're looking, the farther away in time we're looking. So we're actually kind of looking through space, what they call space time. Okay, we're looking through space and we're looking through time as well. And, and if, it, if something is 50 million light years away, that light started out 50 million years ago from that source. Yeah. yeah. So people can think about what was happening 50 million years ago. That was sort of shortly, you know, after the dinosaurs died out. That was 65 million uh, years ago. Uh, so 50 million uh, means that, uh, uh, that, again, sort of just, they just sort of missed the time of the dinosaurs there. So let's see. Um, Toshi, how about one more field of view here? Um, this particular one is in the Virgo group. And that the average, the uh, median distance is about something around 55 million light years, mega light years. So that's what we were talking about, the 55 million. There are others that are even farther away. Maybe we can take a look at, uh, we've got, I know we have one more field, right, Tush? Or yeah, we do. Just, uh, just a quick look at, this is sort of a close-up of the, uh, that galaxy that was in the center, M100 a galaxy here. Again, beautiful, beautiful spiral. But uh, again, let's go ahead and take a look at another, uh, another field of view with uh, several galaxies in here. Again, there's a couple that are pretty obvious there, but maybe you, folks, you can look around in this image and see if you can find any others that you might recognize uh, in the view. Uh, here as well. This is a different part of the cluster. Uh, again, this is why springtime is a great time to be looking for galaxies in these clusters because you can find some pretty bright ones, some pretty obvious ones, but depending on where you have your telescope, you might be able to see a few others as well. Now, Alan, in the last one, you were saying you could imagine lots of them. I can imagine a whole bunch of them. <laughs> because to me, it's hard sometimes to tell a difference between the stars and the galaxies themselves. Do you agree? Yes. Yes, <laughs> this has more, more than the previous view for sure. And, and I know I've seen images that seem to, there seem to be more galaxy images than actual stars. Have you seen those? Yeah, the Hubble, the Hubble deep field when they spent, uh, <laughs> A whole lot of time collecting yeah. light in a particular area of sky. Practically everything that it could see was a galaxy. Yeah, yeah we can go ahead and uh, highlight for everyone uh, that there's a couple more uh, that were highlighted uh, here that are definitely galaxies, but there are actually some other galaxies in this field of view as well. A uh, little bit too faint. I'm not sure that it would show up uh, through streaming on, on YouTube here. Uh, so we didn't highlight them, but uh, definitely a couple more that we have highlighted here. Uh, but uh, beautiful pair of galaxies 
that we have in the center, an, another sort of famous pair that to be looking at, uh, that's sometimes called a butterfly galaxy pair uh, that people look at. And again, these are two spiral galaxies, but it looks like they're about to collide and about to merge. So we're catching them just before they begin interacting and they might uh, turn into an irregular in the somewhat near future here. Uh, and then in this view, you can see some other fainter uh, galaxies uh, going on here. So another mind blowing thing is that the number of stars in each of those galaxies in, is in the uh, hundreds of billions. Uh, you know, yeah. lar large galaxies have hundreds of billions of stars. And there's, I don't know how many hundreds of billions of galaxies out there. So how many stars are there in the universe? I'm glad you don't have to count those, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what I noticed, what I, uh, I, I thought was very interesting when I was uh, studying up on this particular galaxy pair is that astronomers are excited because these are two galaxies which are believed to be getting close to merging, but haven't quite started the interactions yet or just barely started them. Now it's not, they're not excited about it because they feel like they can watch the interaction happen because of that, of course, that the differences won't be apparent for millions and billions of years. So um, there's not really something to be uh, looking forward to, but certainly to be able to do a little bit of research um, on very early collisions like this, the start of early collisions. I know we're sort of running out of time here, Toshi. What, um, uh, do we have any other slides that we wanted to show here? Uh, no, I think that's probably a good place to, to wrap up. And so we'll go ahead and, and, and do that. We'll wrap up here. I wanna thank uh, both Mike and Alan for their time here. And I hope uh, folks were able to enjoy this sort of preview of galaxies. Again, unfortunately, because of the weather, we weren't able to bring you any live views of the galaxies like we wanted to. But if you have access to a telescope, again, spring is one of the best times to be looking for galaxies. So we hope you uh, get a chance someday to look through, tele through a telescope and find some of these uh, beautiful, beautiful galaxies. But uh, Mike, I'll uh, hand the reins over to you for a moment to say, uh, if you can say your goodbyes and, and say your thank yous here. Sure. Um, thanks everybody for coming and uh, giving us a chance to uh, be with you. Um, the Virtual Planetarium, I can't wait until we can get back together in the real planetarium again. Um, and hopefully uh, that will be able to be sooner rather than later. But um, I hope you'll be able to go out and see some of the, let's see, we're, uh, oh, uh, Toshi, maybe uh, I'll finish my goodbye and then uh, you can go ahead and maybe look at some of the questions there. But basically I was just gonna say, um, we'll see you again. We'll be doing some more of these uh, in the future. and. Um, uh, thank you for uh, your attention tonight, Toshi. All right, and uh, I want to kick it over to, to Alan. And, and again, thank Alan for his time once again for sharing his time with us. And uh, Alan, if you have any last words that you'd like to say to everybody. Yes, uh, two things. One, thank you. That was a lot of fun. I enjoyed that a lot. And the other thing is, I'm jealous of the Hubble Space Telescope because they don't have to worry about clouds. <laughs> that's right. Yes, that's why they put it in space. That's the advantage of a space telescope. <laughs> All right. Um, well, I'll uh, close things off here again. Thank you everybody for joining us for this virtual star party. Happy Astronomy Day once again. And uh, even if you don't get to see the night sky tonight because it may be cloudy where you are, like it is for us, hopefully you get to enjoy the night sky. The next time it's clear, whenever that is, but we'd like to thank you very much. Also, we'd like to once again, extend our thanks to the Foothill De Anza Foundation for their support of these star parties. And to let everybody know that the next star party is happening on Friday. So this will be a, a bit of a change in schedule, but it will be happening on Friday, June 18th, Friday, June 18th. And again, we'll be starting at 9 p.m. for that. So hopefully you can join us uh, then. But until then, this is the De Anza College Planetarium thanking you all very much and wishing everyone a very good night. And we'll see you next time.